At the end of episode 4, Heli decided that maybe if her Audi just hung out with her any, that they could actually be friends. Well, no such luck. And what's up with the baby goat guy? Hey everyone, I'm Brent the Middleman, your middle age, middle manager, and middle America in a midlife crisis, here today with another video about the Apple TV show that hits way too close to home, Severance. In this video, I will be breaking down what we saw in episode 5, and see if we got any more clues as to what is actually going on. So, hang the kelp and tell a secret to create a soul void, because this baby is about to be born. The episode picks up right where the last episode ended, with Helly's Innie hanging herself in the elevator with an extension cord. We see as her Audi takes over and starts freaking out. Wow, what a way to start your after work time. Mark looks pretty happy after his wellness session, and he sees Dylan reading Rickon's ridiculous book. The elevator goes back down, and Mark finds Helly hanging, trying to lift her up while the security guy Greener comes sprinting down the hall. They get her onto the ground, and we can see she is moving around, but their main priority seems to be getting Mark onto the elevator and back to Audi land. The transition of Mark freaking out about Helly to remembering nothing about it as he crossed the threshold was really cool. Then seeing him come back to work and slipping back into freakout mode, only to see that Helly's body is gone. Very great face acting here. Of course, waiting for him at the bottom are the non severed management team Milchek and Miss Koble. Mark is sure that he won't see Helly again, that they'll let her resign, but nope, Helly's Audi isn't letting her any off that easy. This will add fuel to the fire that Helly is an Egan, or at least someone high up at Lumen. What would make her Audi want to keep working there? even if it's risking her life. Harmony tells Mark that Helly will be back in a few days, and then makes him feel responsible by saying that it happened on his watch. She says that Mark can thank Kier himself that it worked out the way it did. Kier Egan is the god of the any world, and his handbook is their bible. Later, we hear Miss Coble quote Kier to Grainer, and Grainer says that there's a Kier quote for everything. Even the non-severed workers quote Kier, and Miss Coble knows the handbook back and forth. Are the non-severed workers part of a Kier cult? And are they using the severance procedure to build their numbers? Since they don't seem to be doing any actual work, this would be my running theory right now. While Mark is waiting for Helly to get back, he keeps reading Rickon's book. This part is absolutely hilarious. The quotes from the book had me laughing out loud, and I'll definitely be using some of them in real life. It's great how to a severed any brain with no real world experience, the ridiculous information Rick and Spouts sounds like philosophical genius. Despite being shunned by the literary community, Rickon has finally found his demographic, because just as he says, it wasn't I who was wrong, but literature itself. I think this calls for a dinnerless dinner party to celebrate. A society with festering workers cannot flourish, just as a man with rotting toes cannot skip. They cannot crucify you if your hand is in a fist. What separates man from machine is that machines cannot think for themselves. Also, they are made of metal, whereas man is made of skin. Bullies are nothing but bull and lies. I bet the writers had so much fun coming up with this BS, but it's also scary how close it resembles real-world self-help books. All Rickon had to say was, and ask yourself, who moved my cheese? Grainer tells Miss Coble that they ran a full diagnostic on Petey's chip, and that showed evidence of full synaptic recoupling, which proves severance is reversible. Grainer seems to think this is good news and the board would love to hear, but Miss Coble doesn't seem too anxious to tell them. She just tells Grainer to find out who reintegrated Petey so she can have all the information when she goes to the board. Coble is definitely up to something, and I think she is doing her own research outside of what the board wants. Audi Mark checks his phone after work, and sees that he has a bunch of missed calls from Rickon, letting him know that the baby is coming soon and to head over to the birthing lodge. During the secret sharing session to help create a soul void to help the baby come sooner, Rickon lets Mark know that he is upset that Mark never thanked him for the copy of his book. Mark tells him that he never got it, that it must have been stolen. Rickon says he's glad it got stolen because the thief may turn himself in after reading it. Rickon is definitely one of my favorite characters. And when he asked Mark to help him hang the kelp, that was hilarious. Mark's sister Devin meets the rich pregnant neighbor at the birthing lodge, Gabby, and I get the feeling that this lady may play a bigger role down the line. Maybe she or her husband are board members at Lumen, 
or involved in the Severance Project somehow. Is it weird that the scenes outside of Lumen seem even more odd than the ones inside? Mark also reveals to Devin that he thinks Lumen is up to something, and he learned this from the strange businessman he first saw out her window, which turned out to be Petey. He isn't really able to tell her all of it, though, because she starts to have the baby. The show also shows us that Petey's flip phone is still ringing with that block number, reminding us about it and reminding us that those flip phones had excellent battery life. We jump back to the office, and Milchek lets Mark know that Heli woke up as her Audi, so her innie will need help adjusting. And, of course, Heli wakes up freaked out in the elevator as it hits her that her Audi sent her back even after almost killing her. I'm sure she was really relieved to hear that they've hidden any cords or other dangerous objects so it can't happen again. Oh, and Mark lets her know that she can look for happy numbers for a while. I'm still torn on whether the numbers actually mean anything, or if it's just a mindless task for them to do. Maybe they are learning which numbers give each person certain emotions, so they can then use them at some point later on to manipulate them. All I know is that I've always been afraid of the number 7, because 7, 8, 9. Management has sent Miss Casey to observe Heli, and if requested, give a hug. This kicks off a string of attempts by Dylan to get a hug or more time with Miss Casey, but he keeps getting rejected. Shoot your shot, young man. Respect. I've heard some people say that Miss Casey might be a robot, but I think all the managers are trying to act robotic for some reason, except for Milchek. His job is to have kind eyes. While Heli is being observed, Irv starts to fall asleep again and he hallucinates the black sludge covering his desk and even coming out of Mark's eye. I'm still not sure what this is supposed to symbolize, but it must be important because they even show it in the opening credits. Let me know in the comments what your theories are on the black goo. This event makes Irv want to go visit Optics and Design to see Bert, and Mark asks Irv to make him a copy of the map just in case they need to come find him. At the copy machine, Irv sees two paintings print out. They seem to depict the O&D department workers slaughtering the MDR team. We can tell by the badge colors. Milchek shows up and says he sent those to the wrong printer by mistake, and it was just a joke. Miss Koble is waiting for Milchek in his office and asks him why he decided to pull a 266 on Irv. Milchek said he thought it would discourage Irv from wanting to spend time with Bert. This scenario is common enough to have a number assigned to it. Why would management want the departments to fear one another? They seem to be building up different tribes within the severed floor. But why? We get a good example of how this technique is working when Miss Casey tells Irv that Bird is waiting in the conference room. Dylan has bought into the propaganda so much that he locks Bert in the conference room and seems genuinely afraid of the old man. We find out that O&D has their own rumors about the workers in MDR. The rumor is they have pouches that carry their larval offspring that will grow up, eat, and replace the older worker, and that it will jump out and attack anyone who gets near them. This is so ridiculous and shows what they can make someone with no real-world experiences believe. Irv and Bert then flirt a bit, and it becomes obvious to Dylan that they have feelings for each other, even though office romance is strongly discouraged. Back at O&D, though, they look at a painting depicting Kier meeting his wife at the factory. So even though it's discouraged, they are shown their god, Kier, meeting his wife at work. Are they secretly trying to encourage innies to have relationships? My theory in my last video was that they are trying to get the innies to never want to leave and go back to their Audi life. If they have full lives as innies, why would they ever want to leave? Dylan then finds another painting of workers killing each other, but Irv notices it's reversed. This painting shows MDR slaughtering O&D workers. This makes them realize that they are being misled somehow. We see Heli in the bathroom washing the makeup off her neck that her Audi used to cover up the rope burns. Mark then spills his coffee to get Miss Casey to go retrieve new handbooks so he can sneak Heli off. Mark wants to show her that he started trying to redraw Petey's map, but he needs her help. She's still not having it though, because she is pissed at her Audi for saying she isn't a person. Mark asks her what her innie wants, and she tells Mark that what she wants is to wake up as the life drains out of her body and to know it was her who did it. Um, yeah, I'd say she's pretty upset. They've been walking aimlessly this whole time and realize they're lost when they hear what sounds like a baby crying. They follow the sound and see a baby goat. Dylan had said in a previous episode that he thought he heard a baby crying behind the wall when he was in his break room brainwashing session. Was he hearing a goat? They follow the goat into a room where they see a bunch of baby goats and a man in a suit bottle feeding one of them. 
It's an all-white room with all-white goats, except for the bales of hay on the floor and the dark suit the man is wearing. It's all very odd and out of place. The man then firmly tells them that they're not ready yet, they can't take them, and to get the hell out of there. He seems very upset at the thought of the goats being taken from him. But why goats? What do they do with them when they're older? Are they severing goat brains? I can't wait to see what else is in this building. Helly even wonders if the goats are the numbers they are separating. Are they determining which goats live and which goats die? This was hilarious because I had the exact same thought when I saw all the goats. This crazy incident and Mark saying that he's glad she's there, even if she doesn't want to be, seems to calm Helly down a bit. And she tells Mark she will help him clean up the map because his drawing sucks. We then see that Miss Coble has been watching them this whole time, and I wasn't surprised at all. I would have been more surprised if she hadn't been watching them, as it seems like she is on top of everything that is happening. We find out that Grainer has also been watching them, because he comes in and asks Coble why she's not stopping it. Coble tells Grainer the surest way to tame a prisoner is to let him think he's free. Grainer lets us know that this is another cure quote and says, there's a cure quote for everything. He asks her how many departments she's going to let them find, but Coble pulls a sick power move and tells Grainer that she'll listen to him once he finds out who hacked Petey's chip. Burn. The episode ends with Bert introducing Irv and Dylan to the rest of O&D. He lets everyone know that they're from MDR and they're friends. Irv is the only one who's smiling, and I think it's going to take more than this to overcome the years of propaganda and brainwashing them against each other. And was anyone else hoping that Dylan would lift his shirt to reveal a pouch, and then his larva would jump out and attack Bert? Oh, was it just me? Overall, a very entertaining episode, and it is definitely one of my favorite shows out there right now. The Rickon stuff was hilarious, and the mystery of what is going on at Lumen just keeps growing and getting weirder. Currently, I'm in the, the whole thing is a giant experiment camp, as the way the office is set up like a giant rat maze seems to give it away. We know that Lumen is trying to get Severance to be acceptable outside of the building and city, and even do it to kids. But what's their end goal? To get every human to have one side of themselves that's a clean slate that they can brainwash and bring into the Kier Egan cult? Then why do it to children? They are already a clean slate. Or are they just trying to make money off the Severance product? That just feels too simple to me. There has to be a bigger endgame here, right? For now, I'm going with... It's a giant experiment to see if they can get the working innies to never want to go back to their Audis, creating a giant voluntary slave labor workforce they can offer to any company who wants to cut costs. But we'll see what I think after episode 6. Once again, thank you everyone for watching the channel. The subscription numbers are flying up, and it has me so excited to get more and more videos out to you guys. Also, all the comments are great, and I love reading your theories and responding to them. That's my favorite part. And if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like, and I'll be back with more videos soon, including trailer breakdowns for The Boys Season 3 and Raised by Wolves Episode 8, so keep an eye out. Once again, I'm Brent the Middleman, and I'll see you next time.